to move or not to move. Movement as the second referee. This presentation will perform a deep analysis on the positioning and movements of the second referee in volleyball. When is an appropriate time to move? When should we stay pat? Here is a list of the things that we will cover in today's presentation. First, we'll get into the basics of the second referee. Basically talk about what should happen over and over in almost every rally. Next, we will talk about how to properly award the point. Not only award the point when the first referee brings the rally to a conclusion, but properly awarding the point when the second referee brings a rally to a conclusion. We will look at being efficient at authorizing substitutions. We will analyze the fact that we have stuff to do during timeouts. Next, we will look at blocky. Is probably one of the most important duties, jobs, and responsibilities we have as second referees. We will talk about the fact that we're not going to move during blocking, and we'll show you why. Attacks. Knowledge is power. There are so many different types of attacks that can occur in volleyball, and we'll get into how we should handle those attacks as a second referee. In system versus out of system, we will learn that patience is a virtue. What happens when teams are in system? What happens when teams are out of system? And what does that exactly does that mean? And lastly, we'll bring all of this together. So we are in for a fun, yet very thorough and knowledgeable training presentation. Ask yourself, will these situations require movement by the second referee, or R2, as we are commonly known as? Free balls. Set our attacks, attacks with blocking action, tip attacks, awarding a point, checking lineups, back row attacks, plays near the second referee antenna, dives, and pancakes, substitutions, timeouts, addressing head coaches. Chapter one, the basics. These are the roles and responsibilities of the second referee that will happen every match, no matter the level. Let's get to it. Following the bring of the teams together, the second referee will do the following at the start of each set. Second like referee will check the starting lineup for each team. They will authorize the first libero replacement if applicable. And being the first set, the first referee will be notified of the captain for each team by our second referee. As we watch our second referee in this video, this is Miss Elena Walker, you can see she does the following things well. She makes eye contact with the first referee. She checks the receiving team's lineup first. Now, this is not necessarily required, but we're going to explain why she does this and why this is a very effective strategy. At no point while she's checking these lineups does she enter the playing court. And she uses the substitution zone as her available space when checking the lineups. This is expertly done by Elena for not only checking the lineups and forming First referee of the captain, rolling the game ball to the serving team to the server. She does this in a very efficient manner and wasting very little time. Excellent work by Elena. Now, this is me in a junior varsity match where I'm serving as the second referee. Let's see if I do as good a job as Elena. I'm checking the startup lineup for each team. 
as you can see I'm authorizing the libero replacement if applicable and I'll notify my first referee which is Keith Odom the captain for each team here are some things that I honestly do well in this situation I'm making eye contact with Key. I'm also like Elena did in the earlier video checking the receiving team's lineup first Notice that just like Elena, I am not entering the team's playing court to check the lineups. I'm simply using the substitution zone as my available space when I am checking the lineup. Well done, if I do say so myself. And we're back to Elena's match. And we've seen the video before. This is her for the start of the match, before the start to sit. Checking the lineups for each team. Letting our first referee know who's the captain for each team. Authorizing a rare replacements if applicable. And rolling the game ball to our serving team. Let's emphasize some things that she does very well. And again, this may sound old by now, but these are things that are very important. She utilizes time wisely. She does not enter the play in court to check the lineup. She simply uses the substitution zone as the available space. And because she uses the substitution zone as available space, notice she does not take any unnecessary steps to perform all of her duties. Here's a key in here that I think sometimes we miss as second referees. You notice where the game ball is? Is at the scorer's table. It is not in her hand. It is not with a line judge. It is not with a player. It is at the scorer's table or her disposal. The main game ball should always be at the scorer's table prior to the start of the set. And if our match features a second referee, our second referee will roll the game ball to the serving team after all of his or her duties with regards to lineups and our scoring officials have concluded. Well done by Elena. A lot of our duties our second referee are going to be repetitive. We're going to do them all the time. That's why we go over them a lot in this particular training presentation. The more we practice them, the more we hear it, the more we will continue to eventually perform our duties correctly. After our first referee beckons for serve, Elena scans the receiving team for legal or illegal alliance. If time were to permit, she would also look at the serving team's alignment and then turn her attention right back to the receiving team because the receiving team is her primary responsibility. However, our serving team may eventually become the receiving team. So it's important that Elena has knowledge of the alignments for both teams. There are some things that she does well in this video. She maintains focus with her body position and eyes on the receiving team. And notice she does not move until the ball is contacted for certain. Excellent job by Elena in this play. After the ball is contacted for serve, the second referee will do the following. And the second referee will do the following, assuming that the receiving team's team is alignment is legal when the ball is contacted for serve. Our second referee will move to the new team's receiving side. Excuse me, will move to the new receiving team side. Position himself or herself such that they are there in time for the offense's team's second hit. And usually, when we're talking about the second hit, we're talking about either second hit by the setter and system. And please note that a second hit could also be an attack. We will position our bodies such that we can also see the attack line of the offensive team in case we need to consider things such as back row attacks, overhand sets by a libero. We will also position our body such that it's parallel with the net as 
is seen in this video with a lighter. See the great work that she does as a second referee and taking care of her basics. Now we return to my match while I'm serving as the second referee. Let's see if I can match the excellent mechanics displayed by Elena in the previous video. Once again, when the ball is contacted for serve, I should be moving to the new receiving team side under the premise that the receiving team's alignment is legal. Hopefully I am positioning myself such that I am there in time for a team second hit, which could be a set by our setter and system. It could be an attack by our setter or another player. Hopefully I am positioning myself such that I can see the attack line of the offensive team while maintaining my focus on the receiving team or the defense. I will position my body such that it's parallel with the net. I think I'm doing okay. What do you think? Back to Elena's match. Now, if the volleyball is attacked and our defense attempts to block the volleyball, here's our responsibilities as second referees, as we will see in this video. We're going to watch the blockers from the beginning of their jump to the end of their jump. We're going to ensure that the blockers do not touch the net during their blocking action. We're going to watch the blockers transition away from the net. And we're going to ensure that the blockers or the attackers do not violate centerline guidelines. And we're also going to determine if the volleyball is touched by the blockers. Please note, with all our responsibilities on the blockers, it's going to leave us very little time to ball watch if the ball passes the blockers. Our first and primary responsibility on attacks that involve blocking action are the blockers and the attackers. And we stay with the blockers until they transition away from the net, as it's expertly done by Elena in this video. So Varelli is still in progress. The second referee should do this pretty much all the time. And this will be applicable for most plays. We'll talk about exceptions later in the presentation. We're going to move to the new receiving team side after confirming that we have no net or center line violations and blockers have moved away from the net. We're going to position ourselves that we're in time to see the offense's team second hit, which could be a potential attack. We're going to position ourselves that we can also see the entire receiving team side of the court and at the same time see the attack line of the offense in case we have to prepare for back row attacks by back row players and maybe overhand sets by our libero. And we're going to position our body such that it's parallel with the net as seen in this video expertly done by Miss Elena. So in this chapter of videos, our second referees did the following things well. Body position was parallel to the net during blocking action. When in system, both of our second referees were always, always on time on the receiving team side in time for the second hit by the offensive team. Both second referees were very efficient in their steps. They were never too far from the net pole. Both second referees watched the blocking action from start to finish, including the blockers transition away from the net. And both second referees were far back enough, giving each 
giving each other enough distance to see the entire receiving team as well as the attack line of the offense. Well done by both our second referees. Chapter 2, Awarding the Point. The required movements of the second referee when awarding the point. We're going to talk about a completed rally, which is ended by the referee's whistle. More specifically, the first referee's whistle. When the first referee's whistle ends the rally, the first referee will do the following. He or she will blow their whistle, give the award the point signal, and give the infraction signal. Now notice that the first referee does three different distinct things. Meaning, if you are the first referee, you do not do these things in conjunction with each other. You will have a whistle first. When you have a whistle, you should not have an award the point signal. You must have a whistle. The whistle concludes. Then you will have an award the point signal. Then you will give the infraction. And there are reasons for this mechanic. And we will highlight that reason momentarily. The second referee will do the following. If time permits, the second referee will get to the receiving team side. They will give the award the point signal, give the infraction signal, and scan both benches for potential substitutions and timeouts. As a team, you want to be able to do this sequence in tandem with each other. That means you want to give the award the point signal at the same time, and you want to give the infraction signal at the same time. So the first referee, if you blow the whistle and show a little patience while the second referee gets to the receiving team side, you will be able to do your signal sequence in tandem. Let's talk about awarding the point. Let's see what Elena does when awarding the point where a rally is concluded by the whistle of the first referee. Elena will get to the receiving team side. She will give the awarding the point signal hopefully in sync with the first referee. She will give the infraction signal, hopefully in sync with the first referee. And following the awarding the point, Elena, the second referee, will scan both benches for potential substitutions, barrel replacements, and timeout requests. And because of her scan, she is able to quickly see substitution request by our team on the right. Well done by Elena. Let's see if I can match the excellent signals and mechanics when awarding a point as Elena did in the previous video. I get to the receiving team side. I award the point in sync with my first referee. I will give the infraction signal. And following the infraction signal, I should scan both benches for potential substitutions, timeouts, and maybe libero replacements. If a rally is completed, which is ended by the whistle, of the second referee. If the second referee whistle ends a rally, this is what should happen for both referees. The second referee will get to the receiving team's side. He or she will blow the whistle. Now these two things can be done in tandem because remember for almost all rallies that are ended, the signal sequence is going to go in three parts. You're going to have the whistle. For a first referee, you're going to have a whistle, award the point, and infraction signal. The second referee is reverse. So you're going to blow the whistle as you're getting to the receiving team's side. 
The second referee will first give the infraction signal. Then he or she will give the award the point signal. The first and second referee will give the award the point signal at the same time. And the first referee just gives the award the point signal. And lastly, the second referee will scan both benches for potential substitution and timeouts. So the easiest way to remember this is that the, that the first referee has a three-part sequence. The second referee does theirs in reverse. What if our second referee ends the rally with their whistle? Let's see how awarding the point goes. Now we know that the first referee blows their whistle, awards the point, gives the infraction signal. The second referee actually does this in reverse. The second referee will get to the receiving team side, the offending team, give the infraction signal, then award the point. And as the second referee is getting to the receiving team side, they can also blow their whistle at the same time. Let's see Elena do, do this one more time to follow this process. Following the center line violation, she blows her whistle. Gets to the team side, gets the infraction of the center line, awards the point, and scans both benches for potential substitutions and timeouts. Well done by Elena. Okay, let's see if I can match Elena's good signals and mechanics. The rally is going to come to an end by my whistle. In this particular play, the ball contacts the antenna on my side of the court following an attack. So I'm going to get to the receiving team side or defended team side, blow my whistle, get the infraction signal, award the point, and scan both benches for potential substitutions, timeouts, and little barrel replacements. The first referee should only give the award the point signal in sequence with myself. Now we have one exception to the signal sequence. Remember, we talked about all signal sequences by either the first or second referee having three parts the whistle, awarding the point, and infraction by the first referee. For the second referee, in the rally, we have the whistle, the infraction, and the award and the point signal. And that fouls add one more component. Let's talk about the net foul. When the second referee's whistle ends the rally for a net foul, the second referee will do the following. They will get to the receiving team side while blowing their whistle. Remember, those two parts you can do in conjunction with one another. The second referee will give the infraction signal. In this case, this is net foul. Next, the second referee will indicate the offending player. This is the third step in the net foul se signal sequence. And then, the second referee will give the award the point signal. The first referee will not do anything until the second referee gives the award the point signal. However, in high school volleyball and in NCAA women's volleyball, the first referee after awarding the point will also indicate the offending player towards the receiving team's bench. And as always, the second referee will scan both benches for potential substitutions and timeouts. Now, Elena is going to end this rally once again with a net foul signal. Let's see how this works. We have a net foul by our team on the left by the right side blockers. What Elena will do 
is she'll get to the offending team side, which will be the new receiving team side. She will give the infraction signal of a net foul. She will indicate the offending player with the player's number for National Federation High School and NCAA women. She will give the award the point signal, which will be mimicked by the first referee. And once again, she will scan both benches for potential substitutions, timeout requests, and libero replacements. This is expert work by Elena in this play. Let's see if I can match the expert work done by Elena in the previous play. We're going to have a net foul by our team on the left. I get to the receiving team side. I give the net foul fraction signal. I indicate the offending player by giving the player's number towards the first referee. We both will give the award the point signal. At following the award the point signal, the first referee will mimic the number towards the bench of the offending player. And as usual, I will scan both benches for potential substitutions, timeouts, and libero replacements. Notice something very subtle that I do and Elena did in a previous video. When we end a rally, or we have information to offer the first for free, notice that we step out from my normal position near the table so that the attention can be on us, so that the first referee in the entire facility know we have something to say. That's where we're getting ready to come on the net file. Watch I step out from my position so that everyone sees that I'm giving the net file signal. Well done by myself and Elena. Or I should say Elena and myself. Here are some of the things that Elena and I did well. Especially when we were required to end the rally by our whistle. We perform our signal sequences in sync with the first referee. We always scan both benches after awarding the points. We are very efficient in our steps. We are never too far from the net pole, even when we had to step out, give our signal sequences as a result of violations that were in our purview. We had crisp and strong signals. Our body positions were parallel to the net during the signal sequence. And we made eye contact with our first referees during our signal sequences. Good job by both of us. Chapter 3. Substitutions. The required movements of the second referee when authorizing substitutions. Do not blow your whistle and give the substitution signal until the substitute is in the substitution zone. Notice we have three exclamation marks in this statement. This is urgent and this is important. If you blow your whistle to recognize a substitute and they're not in the substitution zone and the coach changes their mind, we have a problem. By rule, we have a problem. Be patient. Allow the substitutes to enter the zone. Take a second to make sure this is what they want to do. Then blow your whistle and give the substitution signal. We're back to a lameness match. And we're talking about substitutions. So let's see how she performs substitutions following the completion of a rally. The key to this is that Elena has scanned both benches following her award at the point to know that the substitutions and the request are being made. So there's not a lot of wasted time because it does not catch her off guard based on her scan of both teams' benches. She's going to blow the whistle and give the substitution signal 
would she be mimicked by the first referee for NFHS and NCAA women's matches? Elena will give the authorization to enter signal. She will see that both scorekeepers have the correct information on the sub coming in and the player going out, and they are ready. She will do one more scan of both benches for any more potential substitution requests and timeout requests. Lastly, she will give the court back to the first referee. Great work by Elena. We're in a different part of the match. And again, we're going to watch the expert work by Elena. She scans both teams' benches to know that there is a substitution request by our team on the left. She performs her signals expertly. She ensures that both scorekeepers have the correct information and are ready. Scans the benches for any more potential substitutions and timeouts. And she gives the court back to the first referee. Notice how little time this takes. This is great work by Elena. Okay, let's see if I can match the great work done by Elena in the previous video. My challenge in my play is that I have substitution requests for both teams. Let's see if I do this expertly and as efficiently as Elena did in a prior video. You know the process, so we're not going to go back through the process. But notice I do a couple of things here. I give a stop sign to one team while the substitutions for the other team are taking place. This also gives my scorekeepers the time they need to get the substitution information for one team and then being able to get the substitution information for the other team still done in an efficient manner and taking up very little time. I let my first referee know that I need a little more time to make sure that my scorekeepers have accurate information and are ready to proceed. Something great that Elena and I both do in our substitution process Notice that, that we do not turn our back entirely to the court. We turn our head to the side to be able to communicate with both our scorekeepers while still keeping our body parallel to the net and attention to the court. This is great work done, not only by Elena, but by me as well. We're in the second set. Notice we're going to have multiple substitutes for the team on the right. Even though I'm not wasting a lot of time keeping the players in the substitution zone, let's note that we can only allow one substitute to enter the match at a time. Notice I'm not turning my back to the playing court. I still have my head turned towards my scorekeeper so I can communicate all relevant information to them. And because I verbally can communicate the information to them, I can keep my subs from having to stay in the substitution zone for a long period of time, which will be unnecessary, and still give them adequate time to get to their correct positions. And similar to Elena, I try to take very little time to do this entire process. Here are the things that Elena and I did well with regards to substitutes. We're very efficient in our steps. We didn't take too many steps from the net pole. Notice that when potential substitutes enter the substitution zone, we're not in their personal space. We're not all of on them. We want to stay distance from the substitutes coming in and the players going out. There's no reason for us to be in the zone when substitutes and players are in the zone. At no point during the substitution process did we turn our back to the playing court. 
we put ourselves in positions where our body position could still stay parallel to the net while being able to turn our heads towards our scorekeepers and giving them the relevant information necessary to continue to match in an efficient and timely manner. Our signals are strong and crisp. Again, our body position was parallel to the net during our signal sequence, and we scanned both benches before the substitution process to know that we had substitutes coming into the zone and after the process to see if there were any further substitution requests as well as any potential timeout requests, and then we return to court to the first referee. Great job by the both of us. Timeouts. The required movements of the second referee when authorizing timeouts. As we said earlier in the table of contents, second referees, during timeouts, we have stuff to do. When a timeout request is recognized by the second referee, the second referee will do the fall. They will blow their whistle and give the timeout signal. We will give the end signal indicating the team requesting the timeout. We should indicate the number of timeouts that have been used. We will confirm the correct information with the scorekeepers regarding timeouts, regarding the current score, regarding whether our libero is in or out of the current contest, and maybe even confirm our current server and next server for each team. At the timeout's conclusion, a horn will sound or a whistle will blow. The second referee will confirm with the first referee the number of timeouts used by each team. As always, the second referee will scan both benches for any further substitution request. If any hadn't been made prior to the time about beginning, then we will give the court back to the first referee. Similar to Elena in my match, we're doing the same thing. I recognize a timeout request by our team on the left. I blow my whistle, give the timeout signal. I give the end signal indicating the team requesting the timeout. I also give the number of timeouts that have been used by both teams. I confirm all information with scorekeepers that may be needed. The number of timeouts that have been used. Our current server, our next server, libero in or libero out, and other relevant information that's needed. At the conclusion of the timeout, horn will sound or my whistle will blow. I will confirm with the first referee the number of timeouts that have been used by both teams. I will scan both visions for any potential substitution requests in case teams want to make substitutes as long as they haven't used or made any substitute requests prior to the timeout starting. And lastly, I'll give the court back to the first referee. Notes about timeouts. For National Federation of High School and NCAA women, after step two, you can also give the number of timeouts used. After your end signal, you can show the first referee the number of timeouts that have been used. For USA Volleyball, the second referee will only confirm the number of timeouts used in step four. The first referee will not. If a team has used both of its timeouts, then the second referee should notify the head coach by giving the timeout signal followed by the number two. You can also confirm this with the first referee using the same signal sequence. Again, these are the things Elena and I did well with regards to timeouts. I keep harping on the point about our efficiencies and our steps. We want to take smart steps. We want to work smarter, not harder. Never too far from the net pole. Never any reason to be beyond the scorer's table unless we're having a discussion with the head coach.
at no point did we turn our back to the playing court except when the teams were at their benches. And we only turned our back to the playing court at that time because one, there were no players on the floor, and two, we were confirming all necessary relevant information with our scoring officials. You can see we have a good rapport with our scoring tech. This is very important for second referees. Right? You can make or break your match by a positive or negative rapport with your scoring officials. We had crisp and strong signals. Our body position was parallel to the net during our signal sequences. And we scanned both benches after the process for returning to court to the fresh referee. Something that we did not note in the slide, but I made mention to it in the last chapter, and I should make mention of it in this chapter. Do you notice that when Elena and I have something to offer, when we blow our whistle, that we step out a little towards the court and blow in our whistle to offer whatever it is we have to offer? That's something that is probably a good practice for you budding second referees. Chapter five, blocking. The required position and lack of movement, if any, by the second referee during blocking action. If this chapter sounds familiar to you, I hope it is, because the blocking is the most essential duty and responsibility of second referees. So most of this will be a review, but it never hurts to review. There was a prior chapter that we talked about blocking. One of our primary responsibilities as second referees are our blockers. Staying with our blockers from the beginning of their jumps to the end of their jumps. Ensuring that our blockers do not touch the net during their blocking action. Watching the blockers transition away from the net. Ensuring that both the blockers and potential attackers do not violate not only the net guidelines but violate center line guidelines as well. And we must be ready to help our first referee determine if the volleyball is contacted by one or multiple blockers following an attack. See the expert work Elena does and not moving until our blockers transition away from the net. All right, let's see if I match the expert work done by Atlanta with regards to blockers. Remember, whenever blockers participate in the play to the point where they jump, we are staying with those blockers until their jump is concluded and they transition away from the net. We're going to talk about this later. Well, I should go ahead and offer it to you now. If we have a free ball attack or we have a play where blockers do not participate on an attack and we are not worried about our attacker violating the net or center line, the moment we know that the ball is being attacked, we can transition to the new receiving team side. You will see this occur in this play. See that free ball? I was simply able to transition to the new receiving team side because there was no blocking action. Earlier in this presentation, we talked about the habits of the second referee in terms of signals and mechanics being something that will repeat all the time in any match, no matter the level. Again, if a rally continues, our second referee will repeat the process of transition based on our blockers. We will move to the new team's receiving side after confirming we have no net or center line violations by blockers or attackers, and our blockers have transitioned away from the net. 
we will make sure we position ourselves to the point where we are there in time for the offensive team's second hit. We must be prepared for potential attacks. On hit two, we must be prepared to see the attack line in case we have back row attacks or overhand sets by a libero. And we also always want to position our body such that it's parallel with the net as seen in this video. Again, we're pretty much making all the same points in this particular slide as we did in the previous slide. We're just looking at one of my plays from my match. Notice my transitions are dependent on my blockers, if I have blocking action at the net, and the volleyball. When I have free ball attacks with no blockers, I simply transition to the new receiving team side once the ball is attacked. If I have blocking action, I stay with that blocking action until my blockers have concluded their blocking action and have safely transitioned away from the net. With regards to blocking, here are the things that Elena and I both did well. Our body position was always parallel to the net during the blocking action so that we had the widest angle possible on our blockers and could see any potential contact of the volleyball by our blockers. We watched the blocking action from start to finish, including the transition of our blockers away from the net. And again, even in our transition from one team side to another, Notice our efficiency in our steps, and we're never too far away from the net pole. We always want to work smarter, not harder. Chapter 6 Attacks The required positions and or position adjustments that we may need to make by the second referee, depending on types of attacks in volleyball. Here are a few that we see in almost any match. Free balls, setter dumps, setter tips, and set overs. Spike attacks. Spike attacks are the most common one-handed attack that you will see in volleyball. Two-hand attacks, pushed by any player or dumps by front row players. Back row attacks, commonly spike attacks, sometimes tip attacks, and tip attacks. The higher level play a volleyball match is, the, the more likely that you will see all of these type of attacks occur. The majority of attacks occur on the third hit and as we should know or we will know now by rule the third hit must be an attack why because the offense has three hits to get the ball across the plane of the net by rule however Attacks can occur on the first hit or second hit. Thus, the second referee must be in position and ready to potentially have an opinion on an, an attack and anticipate. 
the resulting action by the defense, aka the receiving team. This brings us to chapter 7 in system versus out of system. The required, the required position and lack of movement by the second referee during blocking action. Here's some food for thought. Volleyball is very nice for second referees when we have the following. The first hit is a dig. The second hit is a normal overhand set. And the third hit is an attack. We refer to this as a team being in system. In system gives second referees time and opportunity to get to the new receiving team side in time for the second hit. When things are in system and teams run their office in system, second referees generally do not have to worry about dealing with the results of second hits because second hits will be sets when a team is in system. However, volleyball is not always that nice. When volleyball does not cooperate in the manner we just described, we refer to this as a team being out of system. It is being out of system which tests our ability as second referees which make it such a challenging role. Wouldn't it be nice to know when and when not to move? Gee, I wonder what we're going to talk about. End system. So, if the offense is on hit number three for all of these attacks, free ball attacks, spike attacks, tip attacks, any other type of attack, and the resulting action is blocking or attack, attacking, no blocking, or it really doesn't matter, notice that the second referee never ever moves except if we have a free ball attack resulting in no blocking. Why is that? Let's perform an analysis on this. If the resulting action by the defense is blocking or attacking action, then we must stay put because our number one responsibility are the blockers, the net, the center line, and potential touching of the volleyball by the blockers. If we move, we can't see any of this. If the resulting action by the defense is potential dives or potential pancakes, then we must stay put because our assistance more than likely is, may be needed in determining whether the ball is down or not. Simply put, if a player starts diving to the floor or running to dive to try to attempt to save a volleyball, don't move. If the resulting action by the defense is nothing because they can get to a free ball without extra effort, then we are free to go to the new receiving team side. How will you know? Because Good teams, great teams, high-level teams will say the word free. That is the only time that a second referee probably should move in system on a third hit. When the third hit is a free ball attack where the defense does not have to put any extra effort to contact the free ball. I hope that's helpful. Now, of course, we told you that volleyball is not always that nice. So what happens 
when we're out of system hit number three. Gee, it looks like the same thing that happens when we're in system on hit number three. That is exactly correct. For the very, very same reasons. If we're out of system, the action is going to be very quick. The likelihood that the hits are going to occur faster is high. So again, patience rules today. So if we don't have a free ball attack resulted in no blocking action and in no action where we have players diving to the floor to try attempt to save the ball, then yes, you can move as a second referee on a free ball attack where the defense does not have to make any extra effort to contact the ball for their first hit. Any other time out of system on hit number three, stay put because your perspective and your opinion is needed. My favorite, hit number two. Can you think of what hits normally occur on hit two that are attacks? This should be an easy answer if you have officiated higher level volleyball. Setter attacks, set overs, setter dumps, setter tips, spike attacks by setters, push attacks by setters or push attacks by non-setters. What's eerie about attacks on hit two the responsibility of the second referee is the same. What's eerie similar about hit number two, just like hit number three, there's only one time where a second referee can move after the ball has been attacked. And you already know what that is. A free ball attack resulted in no blocking action by the defense because the defense doesn't have to make any extra effort to contact the volleyball for their first hit as the offensive team. Let's do a quicker analysis on this. It's a lot harder to try to be on the receiving team side by hit number two on out of system plays. If you can, try. If it's not possible, stay put. If the resulting action by the defense is blocking action, we need to stay put because our number one responsibility is what? The blockers, the net, the center line, and potential touching of the volleyball by the blockers. If the resulting action by the defense is potential dives or pancakes, then we must stay put because our assistance is going to be needed in determining whether the ball is down or not. Again, if the resulting action by the defense is nothing because they can get to the free ball without extra effort, then we can go to the new team's receiving team side. Here is the most important point of analysis for attacks occurring on hit number two that you should carry with you in any volleyball match. Attacks on hit number two usually catch defenses by surprise. Second referees, in most cases, I should say in almost all cases, but I'm going to say in most cases, stay put. Hit one. Looking eerie similar. So let's get this out the way. If hit one is a free ball attack by one team. And that free ball attack goes to the new team or the defense who becomes the new offense. And the resulting action by the defense is a pass to the setter of the new offense. That is the only time where the second referee can move because now our new offense has opportunity to be 
in system. Any other attacks on hit one that don't result in passes to the new setter, stay put. The analysis is similar to almost all our other analysis that we have performed, regardless of the hit number of the attack. But there are some special things going on when the attacks occur on hit one. Again, first point, if the defense has to dive or make a pancake save, stay put. Our assistance is definitely going to be needed in determining whether the ball is down or not. Number two is probably the most important point I can make on hit number one attacks. If an attack occurs or a potential attack occurs on hit one by a Dolphins team, it's usually going to result in the overpass. And overpasses, more times than not, are going to result in attacking or blocking action by the defense. And if we have blocking or attacking action by the defense, you know what to do. Stay put. Unless that overpass turns into a free ball attack, resulting in a pass to the setter of the new offense. Any attack on hit number one is going to surprise the defense unless the action is back and forth between opposing front row players. Second referees in most cases. I can make a case for all cases, but in most cases, stay put. What we have learned in all our different hit numbers, one, two, and three, is that the second referee is not going to move unless we have a free ball going to the new offense, resulting in normal effort where our defense can get to the ball without having to give extra hustle or effort. Looks like that's the only time our second referee is going to move during an attack. It looks like regardless of the hit number and all other cases, we're going to stay put. In general, it is a good practice by second referees not to move on attacks. By being patient and staying put, you are in the best position to make the best possible decisions. If system plays simply afford you the luxury of getting to the receiving team side on time for the second hit, you can also find the best possible position to judge all action on the resulting attack. You know the third hit by rule has to be an attack. You've been waiting on this point for almost the entire presentation. Getting to the receiving team side on time gives you the best, gives you time to get the best position to see the second hit and see the offense's attack line. We've been talking about the offense's attack line all presentation and haven't said why. This is why. This knowledge is helpful for back row attacks and knowing whether a back row attack is legal or illegal. It is also Helpful for libero setting, especially when the libero sets overhand, whether she is in front or on the attack line or behind it, back row setters, etc. If the first referee falls asleep on situations because of the attack line, you must save your first referee. You must be there in a good position to see what happens with players on that attack line. That's why we have harped all presentation long on getting to the receiving team side on time for that second hit and being able to see the offenses attack line. If your second referee does not know that a back row attack is illegal, you must know. If a second referee forgets that your setter is a back row setter, you must know. If your second referee forgets that your libero sit overhand on or in front of the attack line, you must know. 
You won't know that if you don't see the offensive attack line. Out of system plays can have you either on the offensive or defensive team side. Either way, stay patient and stay put until opportunity says otherwise. Chapter 8. Break the wall down. Let's bring everything together, why don't we? To move or not to move. We've given you a lot of information in this presentation, and we hope it's been be being very helpful. Now we're going to bring all our analysis, all the chapters together, so you can understand when it's appropriate to move and when it's appropriate not to move, or more, more importantly, recommended to move and recommended not to move. Pre-match and before the set start. You can use the entire substitution zone for checking lineups, authorizing the first libero replacement, and introducing the captain. You can use the entire substitution zone to roll the game ball to the serving team. Because your substitution zone is a nice size area, there should be no point during this time should we have to step onto the playing court. For substitutions, try to maintain your normal position on the receiving team's side for this process if possible. Why? If you're on the team side performing the substitution, it's not wrong. But you know that the rally can't start until you are on the receiving team side because your primary responsibility is to the receiving team side. So as opposed to moving to the serving team side, performing the substitution, I would recommend to stay on the receiving team side. That's where you're going to have to be anyway at the end of the process and you minimize, and you minimize the number of steps that you have to take. Do not encroach the personal space of the substitutes and players. Don't touch them. Don't be close to them. No reason you should have to be close to them. And if you're close to them, it's harder to see the numbers on the back of their jersey. Do not turn your back to the playing court when addressing the scorer's table, if at all possible. Scan both benches before returning the court to the first referee. Timeouts. Try to maintain your normal position on the receiving team side for this process if possible. You can utilize the entire substitution zone if necessary. Address your scores table while the timeout is ongoing. This is the one time where having your back to the playing court is permissible. Scan both benches before returning to court to the first referee. Blocking. If you've learned nothing else in this presentation, you've learned when we have blocking action, don't move. You have so much responsibility during this time. Blockers, net action, net fouls, center line violation. Antennas, we haven't even talked about antenna. The antenna near you is your responsibility. The attacker, if they're approaching the net, the volleyball being touched, it's a lot of responsibility. Don't move. And system plays can quickly become out of system plays, especially during this time. Be patient and stay put. Attacks. Do not move. If the defense is expecting an attack, then you must remember that the defense is your primary responsibility. Again, do not move. If the defense is not expecting the attack, then these are the times where players start diving and attempting to say and attempt saves and pancake plays. Your assistance is needed whether the ball is down or not. Transitions. We have not talked about transitions. When I say transitions, I'm, we're talking about going from one receiving team side to the new receiving team side. Transitions. Take practice. I want to throw this in here 
for you so that you are familiar with it so that's in your head to practice in the video portions of this presentation we will dive a little bit more in our transitions from one receiving team side to another but see if you can get there in three to four steps we've talked about in this entire presentation being efficient in your steps and there are two methods of transitioning from the old receiving team side to the new receiving team side you can start your transition by stepping one foot in front of the other and going from there you can also transition by stepping one foot behind the other foot and going from there again we will look into this more in the video portion of our training presentation Here's some things that I think can be helpful to you in your growth and journey as second referees. Be efficient in the number of steps that you take. Remember, you are going to be standing for a long time. Work smarter, not harder. The only things that should bring you onto the playing court are checking on players, going to the referee stand in a discussion with the first referee, or checking on the playing court conditions. The substitution zone belongs to you and substitutes only. Not bench personnel, not head coaches, not assistant coaches. You and substitutes alone. Wear the most comfortable pair of walking or running tennis shoes. Comfortable shoes are not necessarily the most inexpensive shoes. Stay hydrated. Before you come onto the court, Start your duties not only in pre-match, beginning of the match, stretch. Most of your work should not have you more than three to four steps at most away from the net pole or net stand. Find the most comfortable location where you can officiate to the best of your ability. Some people want to be closer to the net pole. Some people want to be further away, either to the left, to the right, or back and away depending on the facility and how much space they allow you as a second referee. During your pre-match, find what, where it will be comfortable for you so you can work to the best of your ability. The only permissible time to have your back to the playing court is when you are engaged for a long, for a prolonged period of time with the scores table. Usually that would be timeouts or between sets. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. You have successfully completed this course. Give yourself a hand. We want to take time out to give credits to Splash Mania and Unsplash for the use of this PowerPoint presentation template. If you have any questions about anything in this presentation, the material, please feel free to email me at the following email address. Thank you for being a part of this presentation. We hope you gain something valuable for it, from it, whether you are a new or inexperienced official learning to be a second referee or whether you're a veteran second referee looking to get better and sharpen your skills. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us. Have a great day, a great week, a great year, a great season. To move or not to move. Movement as the second referee.